I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We are a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit. It's focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week here on Conservation Connection, we do just that. Introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management, and we ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is a collaboration with EarthX here in Dallas, Texas. EarthX is the largest Earth Day celebration in the world, and it brings in speakers from every corner of the environmental arena. Listen in to hear the stories of today's environmental titans, covering everything from environmental law, ocean health, renewable energy, clean transportation, and so much more. Let's get to the show. Welcome, everybody, to another EarthX episode. We're here in Dallas at the EarthX conference, and we're really excited because we are sitting down with Vance Martin, who is the president of the Wild Foundation. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're so happy to have you here today. Just to kind of give our viewers a snapshot of what you do, could you tell us what is the Wild Foundation? The Wild Foundation is a is a, a U.S. based nonprofit conservation organization um, that actually began in Africa about 50 years ago, the result of uh, the work of a very famous white conservationist named Ian Player and his Zulu mentor, brother, father, friend um, named Makubu and Tombella, uh, and they worked together during apartheid when the racial segregation was the law, but these. Two men came together and they worked in the wilderness. Uh, They saved the white rhino from extinction. Out of that uh, came the idea to have an organization in the States. So we actually are, we we consider ourselves an African born conservation organization. Now what we do uh, is we're based in the States in Boulder. Our focus is really about wilderness, but not necessarily uh, the way that many American groups work on it, because in America, there's the Wilderness Act. Right. And it's very unusual. Only about nine or 10 countries have that. Um, but we work around the world to protect wilderness while also trying to meet the needs of local people. And we uh, do that uh, in Africa. We do it in Asia. Uh, we do it sometimes through working, for example, in West Africa, in the country of Mali, where there's a very special herd of desert elephants and the local people like them, and uh, they, they want them to stay. I could tell many stories about how interesting it is, these very, very poor people. And there's only two herds of desert-adapted elephants in the world, and that's one of them, and they migrate through the desert. Anyhow, we work there with the people so that the people know how to manage the elephants and protect them and get the benefits from that. That's so great. We, we have a small staff, uh, but in Mali, I have 600. Wow. Wow. They're groups of four. They're eco guards, all from the local villages. They all get paid. Wow. So that's what I mean by trying to meet the needs of local people and still doing conservation. This area in Mali, in central Mali, is the size of Switzerland. And uh, there's essentially no government. It's a war zone. So it's, uh, it's a very challenging very expensive project, and we're there because the people want us there. I really love the fact that it comes from getting local people to take ownership over their own yeah. wilderness. Because if you think about if Wild Foundation had to hire 600 people that were employees of Wild, that would not be very easy to do it or scale up at all. But no. by leading the locals and showing them how to protect their own wilderness and how to care for their own wilderness, that's a much more sustainable and scalable way to do it. Yeah. And I think that the thing I'd like to point out about the work that we do, and uh, when you think of a project like that, you don't think of the of the word leadership. But you know, one one of the things that we really focus on is is developing leadership. And we consider our work in Mali with these very poor villagers, developing their capacity to lead themselves and to make their own decisions and to empower them. And it's every much a leadership exercise as it is when I work with ministers, heads of state, which we do often. Um, So developing uh, personal confidence, 
personal empowerment and political will can happen at any level, family, village, nation, globe. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really cool. I have a question from that. How do you choose these places that you work in or do they kind of come to you? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a mixture. We're a small organization. As I mentioned earlier, sort of a, an overambitious global agenda for our size. But I've always worked uh, overseas. Um, I left uh, the States a week after I graduated from university for a six-week stay in Europe. And I stayed f overseas for about 15 years. Wow. wow. So I've, I'm, I'm very used to working uh, in different cultures. And, um, you know, the work comes to you largely because you really want to help. And obviously, you can't say yes to everything. And there has to be some funding, of course, because right. we're not we're a, f a foundation, but we're an operating foundation, which means we have to raise money all the time. Um, so there's a lot that goes into the decisions. And um, I have to sometimes say no, which is not easy for me to do. But, um, you know, our work with young people, for example, through Coalition Wild, one of our programs, um, that's largely volunteer. There's only one partially paid staff, and it's run by a council of young professionals, all volunteers. So I worked as a volunteer myself uh, for 10 of those years overseas. I worked at a nonprofit, and uh, I got paid five, five pounds a week. <laughs> and um, so that in American terms back then, that was about $9. A week. a week. A week, yeah. Making and I the had big a, bucks. I had a little food allowance, but I was essentially a volunteer. I have, you know, I don't come from a wealthy family. During that process, I uh, had two children, got married. Uh, I know what it's like to be a volunteer. So I, uh, when I talk to people and I ask them to help, I know what I'm asking them to do. Yeah. And when they make that help, it's an opportunity for them to really make a difference, both in their own life and certainly in that of the world. Absolutely. I want to go back to Coalition Wild. So Coalition Wild is a project of the Wild Foundation. And, and what is the goal of Coalition Wild? Coalition Wild is to uh, create a peer-to-peer -peer relationship amongst young professionals who are either working professionally in conservation or want to or spend an awful lot of time as a volunteer. <laughs> um, and so we find that th through peer-to-peer -peer networks, you get uh, you create a synergy and by synergy i mean two and two can equal ten yeah you know there's a, a a factor when you collaborate for the right reason and you put your heart and soul into it you can create much more than just two people working together so our signature style of work is collaboration and coalition wild is a very good example of that where could people go to find out more about Coalition Wild and how they could get involved? Well, that's, uh, you know, of course, our main website is wild.org, uh, and they can go there. But coalitionwild.org has its own website. Um, and that's very typical of how we work, too, because we're, uh, our interest is not in building a large, vertically integrated institution. And by vertically integrated, I mean, you know, continually increasing budget, continually increasing staff, which means continually increasing admin. Uh, you know, our, our goal is to create a movement. And so uh, we have an expression, which is that we're just as busy giving it away to empower other people uh, as we are keeping our, our own doors open. And when, by giving it away, I, I don't just mean money. I mean, reaching out to people and finding out what they want to do. Like, like when we're in these villages and we're working, sometimes we'll do social surveys for a year or two to find out what these people really want. And then not giving them the answer or the money all the time. See, foreign aid, as defined by the US and Europe, is we have the money, we have the answer, and here's your timeline. Uh, right. Our work around the world is it turns all three of those things on its head. The people you're working with and for, they have to have the answer. You can help them find it, but if it's not their answer, they're not empowered. If it's not their answer, it's not their solution, and it's not going to be something that they 
are able to sustain by themselves. Absolutely. Once you leave, yeah, yeah. it has to keep going. Yeah, it's the principle of empowerment, and uh, it's you know it's really the same all over the world. And even when you don't, we, we're not a big money organization. We have to go out and raise it. And you know, in this one example in Mali that I talked about, it's very expensive. Because, you know, you have to train and deploy anti-poaching and, and you have, we provide medical care. A um, lot of conservation solutions, training women and all that. But what, what you're really doing in the end is you're helping people be in charge of their life and see the connection of that to a healthy resource of wild nature. Absolutely. We've hit on what is the Wild Foundation. We've hit on Coalition Wild. Another really big initiative that y'all have, though, is Nature Needs Half. And now I want to dive into that a little more, if you'll get into that for us. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Nature Needs Half is a a concept. Uh, It's really our overarching goal. Uh, We launched it in 2009. And the object is very simple, um, to protect and connect half the world's land and seas so that they're high functioning natural areas supporting people and creating a beautiful healthy environment for wildlife and for people it's a science-based proposition because all the best conservation biology shows us that if large natural systems get too small they can't produce what are called ecological services and that is you know jargon and uh, what i call it is life support Absolutely. You know, it's clean air, clean water, biodiversity, uh, climate control, weather mitigation, all that. I mean, it's the idea that a tree does things that make life on Earth possible. As a tree grows, it's pulling carbon dioxide out of the air, Mm -hmm. taking that carbon, and it's turning into the tissues that make up that tree. The wood is Mm -hmm. made of carbon. Absolutely. And that is a service that it does is it pulls carbon out of the air and it puts oxygen that's vital for all life out into the atmosphere. That tree does things that make our life better. That's it. And as the ecosystem gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it's less able to perform services like that. Now, that's a great description, and I'm going to use that. But um, (laughs) I'll just say one or two other things about Nature Needs Half. One is, yes, it's based on very good science. It was not very popular when we launched it. We were laughed at by many, um, especially politicians, but the other conservation groups wouldn't adopt it. It's now become the new norm. Professor Wilson, uh, E.O. Wilson at Harvard, produced his book a, a couple of years ago called Half Earth. He's a wonderful spokesperson. He calls it something different, but that's fine because that's a movement. Right. Um, so, yes, it's science-based, but there's more to it. And part of it is that it's it's also based on traditional knowledge. It's based on indigenous people, how they've related to the earth, which is through relationship. And that's really, I'm not a scientist. We do a lot of science. Um, It's not my thing. I work with scientists every day. What I'm interested in and what Wild tries to do, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's this link between wild nature and people. How do you create a relationship? Because there's that wonderful old saying, if you, if you don't have a relationship with something, you, you know, how are you going to save it? Because you don't care about it. Absolutely. So um, I used to have a business card that didn't say president of the Wild Foundation on it. It said relationship counselor. <laughs> um, because really, in, in the conservation business, which is what we're in, I mean, it is a business and you have to raise money and, and you have to do good work that people want. So you have a product. But one of our products is re- relationship building, you know, because um, that in the end, I like to say something that means a lot to me is that is that if there's one thing that everybody on earth has in common is that they have a relationship with something, a wife, a husband, partner, business, child. And there's one thing clear that all of us know that if you want to have a successful relationship, you got to meet your partner halfway. You got you got to be there. That's true. So that's what we're saying about the Earth. Let's meet the Earth halfway, yeah. at least. At least, I absolutely agree. I believe very strongly that the most important thing you can do to help protect the planet is spend time in nature and experience it, and allow that to fill you up and set you on fire. Because the kind of authentic passion that comes from experiencing nature it can't be reproduced any other way than by genuinely experiencing 
the majesty of the outdoors. Chance, you're, you're exactly right. And I'll, I'll tell you a very short, interesting story is, um, you know, our founders, who I mentioned, you know, was a very famous game ranger and his Zulu brother, Tracker, and they saved the white rhino from extinction. And in that process, they realized that that wasn't going to solve the issue. So they quit the uh, wildlife service. And they set up an experiential program called the Wilderness Leadership School. This was in early in the 1960s in South Africa, taking multiracial groups, small, small groups, eight people, into the wilderness for five days to do exactly what you're talking about, to, to have an experience of themselves, of the majesty of nature, and also being able to resolve and understand across sectors, across races, how to work together, how to be together how to love each other, for goodness sake. This is something that the conservation movement never talks about. They yep. never talk about loving each other. And in my mind, until we learn how to love each other, and nature can help us do that. And to kind of tie all of that back to where we are sitting today, EarthX is a great example of people coming from all different sectors, sitting down in the same room and having that discourse, having those conversations regardless of each individual's viewpoint. You know, I may not support what you believe, but we can sit down and we can have a conversation. Not that I'm talking about you in yeah, particular, sure. Vance. Of course <laughs> I support that. But, you know, I can have a conversation. We can all have conversations with people who come from a different place and learn something, walk away knowing more than we did before, even if I don't agree with you. No, uh, absolutely. And the experience of nature and how nature works and many people ask us, because this program is still operating. It's called the Wilderness Leadership School. It's based in South Africa. In fact, the head of Coalition Wild, Krista Valentino, just was out on a trail. Oh, five, wow. five days. Yeah. That's amazing. And um, I was on the phone with her when, when she came back. And I said, how was it? And she said, the answer is, I didn't have enough. I want more. So there's so much there. Uh, and people say, oh, is it like Outward Bound? No, it's not. We call it an inward looking outward bound. Mm. It's not maximum stress. It's, uh, you know, you're walking not a long way. The, the, you know, you have to carry a pack, but it's not a big deal. The thing is to not use nature as a classroom. Consider nature the teacher. And by doing that, you're creating a relationship with nature. Yeah. And guess what? Pretty soon you're loving nature and you're learning how to love people as well. I completely agree. Yeah. So, of course... Maybe not everybody can get all the way over to Africa to right. experience this. So I'm curious to hear what you would tell people to do in their own day-to-day -day lives or maybe, you know, during the summer or something. How can they get out in their environment and make this own experience for themselves or even their family? Yeah, you know, part of it is simply, um, is simply paying attention. There's nature everywhere. And all the studies, I mean, I don't want to quote all the stuff that everybody <laughs> already knows, uh, you know, that, that even the view of a tree outside an office window, you know, what the study shows that does for productivity, mental health. So the thing is that nature is, is everywhere. And I love Africa. I love the Rocky Mountains, et cetera, and, and, and so on. But I just try to look at nature wherever it is. And that's what I recommend people to do. And guess what? I'm a tree hugger. <laughs> <laughs> unashamed because contact touch a plant just sit in the grass or pick sit up in a the flower. grass yeah, yeah yeah so yeah i mean uh, i'm fortunate because i i do get a large dose of wild nature even though i spend a lot of time in very polluted cities like well i spend a lot of time in china and a lot of time in india but no matter where i am i look for nature and that's what everybody can do Absolutely. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Mm. This has been a wonderful conversation. Well, it's my pleasure. I love what you guys are doing. And I encourage all of your listeners to listen more to what you're saying, because this is a, this is a really good initiative. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. 
If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet, and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.